in Canada, where there's so much obeisance and, and le letting it go, letting everything go, shutting down the churches, we've seen that. But a few pastors have stood up. A few pastors have stood up and absolutely rejected the tyranny of discrimination against Christians, discrimination of people of faith, uh, to stop their worship. And take a look at this clip. This is Pastor Arthur Pavlovsky in his first appearance to most of us, uh, as we saw him telling the police officers forcefully to remove themselves from his church. Take a look. Go! So go! Go! And don't come back without the warrant! Out, Nazi! Out! Out! You understand? Nazis are not welcome here. Out! And don't come back without the warrant! Do not come back without the warrant! You understand that? You're not welcome here. Nazis are not welcome here. Gestapo is not welcome here. And we are going to be speaking with Pastor Arthur Pavlovsky right now. Stay tuned. Pastor Arthur, it is so good to be with you. Welcome to this episode of the John Henry Weston Show. Thank you very much for having me in. It is, a, it is a great privilege for me to speak with you. Um, you should know that uh, in, in very many ways, you're a hero in Canada. You have pointed the way to defense of the freedom of worship in a way that really, for, for most of America, for most of Europe, has been very alien. You were forceful, of course, charitable, but you were forceful. And uh, I'd like to hear about that. But first of all, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, um, I grew up in Poland, as you can tell by my accent, behind the Iron Curtain. So I have seen firsthand the atrocities that were done to my people in my country, uh, you know, by the Soviets. When Europe was, and the whole world was celebrating the victory over the Nazis, Poland was taken over by the Soviets. And I'm telling you, socialism and communism is a, like a black plague. It destroys everything that touches like a cancer. So my country was rubbish, destroyed. People were depressed. People uh, turned into alcohol for hope and faith. I mean, that was the biggest thing. Faith was the number one thing uh, that was holding the people together. And John Paul II, of course, coming to Poland and praying. I had pr privilege to do a Christian festival, a March for Jesus, in the very place where John Paul II said, God, the Holy Spirit, come and touch that, touch this, this land, this ground. And I actually quoted uh, him uh, on, the same, on the same spot. Millions of people were, were touched. Millions of people were encouraged. And after many, many years, after decades of Soviets destroying our country, finally, 1981, Polish people took to the streets. They had courage. Tens of thousands were arrested. Some were murdered. But eventually, after a big struggle during the Solidarity Movement, they won their freedom. So I grew up hearing about the Nazis. I grew up hearing about the Gestapo SS. Um, in my town, where I was growing up, was a concentration camp. So as kids, we were playing in the bunkers that Germans built to, to murder people. Um, so I've heard from my grandparents about the atrocities of the Germans that they did in Europe and in Poland, of course. And then, firsthand, I saw what the communists did, the police brutality, arrests, Eating, torturing, lawlessness, propaganda machinery, uh, non-stop. You were not allowed to listen to anything. If you were caught listening to European radio in Poland, you could go to jail for five years. But of course, after you were brutally arrested and tortured and then sentenced. If you were caught with uh, something that was outside of the propaganda, so a leaflet uh, or something else that was contrary, a book, for example, that was prohibited under the Soviet era, you could be tortured and sentenced to jail. If you were caught with one American dollar, you could go for one year to jail. So I've seen a lot of things, but I also have seen good. I've seen when people come together and fade. I will never forget this image when tens of thousands of people took it to the streets and they built this huge, huge cross and they marched with that cross and the soldiers were sent and they were ordered to shoot them dead, but they, they finally refused to do it and the people won and they prayed because prayer was illegal. Congregating together, just like today, was illegal, but people, by the tens of thousands, they did it. So what I'm trying to say to you, there is hope. Listen from a guy that grew up under craziness, hearing the stories uh, of uh, the Nazism and fascism and then seeing the communism, you know, destroying everything. But people rose together and here we are together. I am a father. I have three children. I was uh, in monastery in Poland. I was to become a priest. God had a different plan for my life. So now I am a pastor. I'm serving God. I'm feeding thousands of people on the streets of Calgary. I escaped on a boat, uh, irony, <laughs> on a Russian boat to Istanbul, Turkey, and then to Piraeus in Athens, where we actually literally escaped uh, from that boat. And we were threatened that we would be arrested. But uh, God opened the doors and we uh, went to the other side of the fence, uh, throwing our belongings through the fence. And, and um, we lived in Greece for five years. And Irony again, the Canadian government said, we want people like you come, sell your business, sell your belongings, come to Canada. Why? Because it's the freest country on the planet Earth. No one will persecute you for your faith. And we finally decided after many years of living in two countries that were very corrupted, everything was run by bribery and, and constant fear. We came to Canada to start all over again in 1995. I have three children and uh, this is my home. I love Canada. I am willing to fight for this land. And I pray the same prayer that John Paul II prayed. God, Holy Spirit, visit this land, touch this land. Amen, amen, amen. Now, so this is very interesting. You lived through a kind of brutal persecution, and yet you find in yourself, despite watching, I'm sure in, in, the, in the communist times that you lived through, you would have seen families arrested, you would have seen children taken from their parents, you would have seen, as you said, a brutal torture of people. 
yet you're still willing to to speak out and do so forcefully uh, in, in defense of freedom. Where does that come from? Everything comes from God. I give all the glory to God. I mean, I said quite often and publicly and to my congregants that God had uh, blessed me with amazing people, freedom fighters, lovers of people, lovers of this country. But I always tell them, listen, I do not work for you. If you think for a second that you pay me and I work for you, you're delusional. I have only one God as boss and you're not God. I work for him. And when he tells me to do something, I will do it, even if offends all of you and you will choose to leave this place. Everyone comes with a free will. You can choose to serve God or you can choose to serve the enemy, but you have to make a choice. I have chosen to serve God. When my son was born, Nathaniel, the first one, Nathaniel in Hebrew means gift from God, a gift of God. And when he was born, he was born dead. Uh, he had a heart on opposite side, smashed lungs. I was in a business realm at that time. And I always thought that you can buy anything you want with money. I always had this saying, you know what, it's just a matter of how much. And everyone is for sale. At that moment, 21 years ago, I realized that there are certain things you cannot buy. You cannot buy happiness. You can be the richest man on the planet Earth and you can be the most miserable person on Earth. You cannot buy health. You can have all the money, but if something is broken and the, the people cannot fix it, that's it, you're done. You cannot buy time. Time is a precious commodity and you only have one chance on this side of eternity. So use it wisely. You cannot buy a happy marriage. You cannot buy peace. There's some things that you cannot buy, and I could not buy the health of my son. I think this was the first time that I really realized there's someone more powerful than money, more powerful than politicians, more powerful than lawyers, judges, and, and the mighty dollar. And I struggled. I have to tell you, that was a moment when I had my big rebellious fight with God. I accused him of everything. I said, why me? Why me? You know, we always have this saying, why not the neighbor? Why is this happening to me? What have I done? I was not the, the worst guy on the planet. I mean, I was not like Hitler. I did terrible things, but this guy is worse than me. So why is this happening to me? Of course, that doesn't work that way. God wanted my attention and he got it. And I had a vision and I would encourage you to watch a documentary that was done on my life. It's called Street Advocate, the movie. A famous movie director came and he did the documentary and I'm telling all that story uh, over there. But I, I had a vision and I'm telling you as a businessman, I did not believe in visions. I did not believe in this, you know, hocus pocus. I said like those people are, are missing something in their brain. Uh, and we always had the saying as businessmen, show me the money. So I want to touch it, then I'll believe it. Like a doubting Thomas, if you will. And it happened to me. I mean, it was the craziest thing. My son is dying. The doctor said he's not going to live. Uh, they said even if he survives this time, he's going to be vegetable for the rest of his life. And they told me three doctors to unplug him. My wife said no. She started to pray. She called everyone she knew. Many churches were praying. Many family and friends called other friends. So there was a, a huge amount of people that were praying and visiting the intensive care in the children's hospital here. Me, in other hand, I was just watching this whole thing like what's happening to somebody else. After my rage against God, after me calling him names and like lifting fists and, oh, you, how terrible you are. Then I calmed down and I just observed. And I saw Jesus Christ in Gethsemane. I saw the torture. I saw the beatings. I can tell you the conversations they had. It, it was incredible. And the beatings were so severe. I ran away from the hospital. And I came back the next day and it started again. It happened to me three times until I saw the crucifixion. I saw the darkness. I saw the earthquake. I, I saw when the creation was crying. And then I heard a voice talking to me. And he said, what would you do? To save your son and i said anything It'll ask me to kill and i'll kill i will wipe out half, half of this hospital if it needs to be so my son can live but he says but you cannot do anything to save your son but i could save my son and i didn't do it you know why and he paused and he says for you and for the rest of the people i'm telling you at that moment i realized how evil wicked of a person i was i would kill your son so only i don't have to be in pain i would wipe some of this father or, or mother just so i can escape the, the, the pain but this father i don't think we fully can understand what he has done he chose to be in pain he chose to suffer that was his free will. He chose to give the, his only begotten son. And for whom he did it? For a person like me. I was his enemy. I didn't like him. I walked away from him. I wanted him to leave me be. And he died for me. It was, it was the most, I don't know how to call it. My heart was broken. It broke in half. I realized how amazing this God is. And if only people would understand how much he loves you, how much, how, how much he appreciates you, he created you, he cherishes you, he, he, he wants to spend time with you. He doesn't want you to just come to him and give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. He just wants to have a quality time with you. He wants to talk to you. He wants to take you on his lap and just, hey, tell me how was your day. Don't just ask me for, for, for pennies. Don't ask me for another ice cream. Just, hey, just spend time with me. You know, uh, my heart is broken when I see people constantly coming to God and they're just, give me, give me, you know, toonie and, and a chocolate bar comes out. Go to church, go to God and say, God, what I can do for you? How can I be of assistance to you? Father, daddy, what I can do? Here I am. Use me, touch me, send me. I'm willing to go and fight for another soul. I'm telling you, if you do that, you're going to touch the heart of the father in the most amazing way you can imagine. So that's what happened to me. And I cried. I went to the church first time since my son was, was born dying. And I started to cry like never before. And every tear was representing something that I've done, all my sins. Every tear was representing another sin, another deed that I have done, another words that I have spoken. And I don't know how long I was crying, but when it was over, I had no more tears. I calmed down. All my, hand, my, my hands were raised towards heaven. And my son was like Isaac, like Abraham has given Isaac on the altar. I have given my son, Nathaniel, the gift from God on the altar. My son was born the same day I was born, March 28, 2000. And I, has, I have given him on the altar like Abraham, Isaac, and nothing happened. 
you would think after such a dramatic situation, me seeing what I saw, and, and you would think something will happen. Someone would speak to me, an earthquake perhaps, or a wind or a fire. Nothing. Nothing happened. I just had no more tears to cry. Went home, and the next day I went to work. I came back to the hospital, and behold, everyone was pointing a finger at me, saying, that's the father of the star baby. Look, that's the father. That's the father. I reached the intensive care. The same three doctors came, and here is what they said. you got to come with us. Something happened. Because, you know, I was walking there expecting that my son is, is dead. I gave God my word when I had no more tears. I said, God, whatever you're going to do, whatever is your answer, if you choose to take him home, I just pray you would do it now. So this horror, this suffering for me and my wife would end. But if you will heal him, I'll be grateful for the rest of my life. But nevertheless, I'm giving you my oath right now. And if you know anything about me as a businessman, a handshake was a contract, was good enough for me. My word was everything to me. So I said, no matter what you will choose, I'm giving you my, my oath today. I will serve you for the rest of my life. And like I said, nothing happened until the next day. I go to the hospital. They take me to another, another room with x-rays at that time. And they said, uh, we can't explain what happened. But your son should not be alive, but is living. Your son should not be breathing because all the machinery was doing all of that for him. But he's breathing on his own. So we started to take pictures every hour. And they said, look at this. There was no line. When we, when we opened him up, I have a surgeon's uh, report. It says there's not even a trace. They could not find even a trace of a lung. But he says, look at the pictures. The lung is appearing. Every hour is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Your son is breathing on his own. That's a medical impossibility. We call the symposium of doctor. And this is what they said. We called your son a star baby because it's like a baby that came from the stars. It should not be alive, but it's living. It should not be breathing, but it's breathing on his own. We cannot explain it. Medically speaking, a miracle happened. And this is what the doctor said. It looks like your God has answered your prayers. You know, it takes me an hour and a half to tell the story. But at least you know now why am I so radical? Because I have seen, I have seen. It's like the apostles in the book of Acts chapter 4 and 5. They say, we have seen, and they have seen mighty things of God. And they say, we must testify of what, on, on what we have seen. I must testify that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That he's unchangeable God. That he is a living God. And he wants to touch you. He wants to change you. He wants to let the people know that he is interested in your affairs. And he loves you so much that he has given himself for you and me. So after that, I started to work with the homeless people. In 2005, we started a ministry called Street Church, and uh, right now there is 40, 50 churches like this all over different countries and continents. I started orphanages, clinics, churches, Africa, Belize, Barbados, you name it. I started also a movement that is called March for Jesus. I organized marches all over the world and also Christian festivals, and, and I pastored two churches in the city of Calgary. Wow. <laughs> We're going to show a clip um, of your arrest. Um, of um, your, um, in, in this most recent incident, uh, which I really want to address with you, um, of your house uh, attempted to be burned down. In fact, they, they did burn down your garage. So uh, let's roll those now, and uh, then I'll get your reaction to them. So, Pastor Artur, if you could tell us first of all about the arrest. Uh, you know, you were arrested. What, what went through your head at the time? And uh, what's your takeaway from that? You know, think about it. For every person that is living in a Western society, you would think that you have protection of law. We are not living in a country that are lawlessness. We have the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. We have the Constitution. We have Criminal Code of Canada, uh, Section 176. And it says, uh, you know, one, two, three. It says that uh, we are protected. The clergymen are protected. You cannot interfere. You cannot disturb. You cannot harass clergymen going in or coming out uh, after he is or before officiating. You know, in capacity of his duties, you cannot disrupt church service. I mean, you think you are living in a in a, a country that respects the rule of law and preamble to our Charter of Rights and Freedoms to the fundamental rights the government is giving us that's why i came to this country that was the only reason because i was making lots of money in greece and that was my el dorado i came to canada for one purpose for freedom that's it i wanted just to be a free man living in a country that is uh, run by law and order i was sick of bribery i was sick of corrupted police officers and politicians i wanted to come here for freedom and security and that's uh, being taken away from me so knowing the law knowing that we are fully protected that they cannot do what they're doing right now i was of course shocked i was enraged i was upset what is happening we are being taken over by some kind of a communistic fascist hybrid that's why i called them i called them you know i've called them gestapo because they're starting to act like gestapo they, they turn their uniforms from blue into a dark blue looking like a black and then a swat team coming to the church and they look more like ss gestapo than than uh, officers that when you see them you say oh thank god there is a police officer over there no they look like a uh, gangster working for mafia right now there is lawlessness in the land there is total disregard to the rule of law in the preamble it says that canada where is canada 
recognizes the supremacy of God. Where is supremacy of God? God says very clearly, we are to gather. That's what God says. We are to lay hands on the sick. We are to officiate services. We are to sing praises to God. We are to come together as a family and worship our Creator. It's protected. It's given. It's a God-given, but also a state-given right that we have. And all of that is being taken away uh, from us on pretense of some kind of a, a lie that is circulating uh, right now around the world, which data doesn't support. The statistics are telling totally opposite story. However, those people don't care. They don't care that they're lying. They don't care they're manipulating. They're doing this on purpose, destroying the middle class, eliminating small and medium-sized businesses, while at the same time, Costco, Superstore, Ikea, they all can do whatever they want, and mosques are not shut down. The imams, there's not even one imam that has been ticketed. Forget about arresting. Not even one ticket the Muslims got it. But Christians, by the thousands, are being hunted down. The pastor's now arrested. So we know it's a communistic takeover. So what was going through my head? I said, what happened? Where are Canadians? Where, where are the real politicians? Because what we have right now is some kind of a mafia ruling over this country. And, you know, preamble continues, the supremacy of God and the rule of law. Where is the rule of law? Where is actual law right now? They're, they're acting against the rights. They're acting against the law. And they're using law to do that, to take away our, our, our rights. So when they showed up at the church, they brought SWAT team. And I'm thinking to myself, what's wrong? What is in the head of those people? We are nonviolent. I've never been charged with assault in my life. I am not violent. There is no record of violence whatsoever. It's a peaceful assembly. It's a peaceful church, and they're bringing SWAT team. So why they're doing this? They're doing this to suppress, to intimidate, to harass. And they have been doing this for the past 15 years, taking pictures of our women and, and uh, children. That's what the Soviets did. That's just what the Gestapo did. If they cannot get the men, they will intimidate the men by saying, hey, we know where your wife works. We know where your children go to work. We know. We can hurt them to hurt you. Be careful. And those are the tactics identical to the tactics of Gestapo and the KGB. That's why I call them Gestapo and KGB and fascists and communists, because they're acting like those old boys from the past. So when the SWAT team shows up at the church, and I was told, of course, I was already at the front of the church. The church was in the full, uh, you know, uh, worship, and someone yells, the SWAT team is coming. So I thought I'm going to be arrested at the pulpit. But they opened the door, and they left. I was told they, they left. I said, oh, praise God. So maybe today I'm not going to be arrested for my horrible crime of opening the church and, and preaching the gospel. So they left. I was told that they dropped something later on after the church was over. They dropped something on the ground. I said, don't touch it. I don't know what it is. I mean, this is crazy. You know, it could be a biological weapon as far as I know. I don't know. No one presented me anything. No one talked to me. No one sent an email. No one notified our lawyers. We have lawyers for 15 months. They know we have lawyers. They know uh, that we always tell them, talk to our lawyers because we're not lawyers. They have to figure it out what, what is really going on and the legality of, of the things. But no, they've chosen to drop something on the ground. I told the people, don't touch it. Um, let the lawyers deal with that. If they have something to give me, let them give it to the lawyers so they can figure it out. And people left, and I started driving home. Uh, me, a driver, Dave Hughes, and uh, my brother David, David Palowski. And in the middle of a busy highway, we were stopped by a SWAT team. We were, uh, you know, the officer comes to the window, says, you're under arrest. And he turns to my brother David, says, you're under arrest, which is, which is insanity. Why my brother was arrested. I was the pastor. Op I opened the church. I officiated the service. You know, so I broke the law, according to them. Why, brother? Because you see, again, they're acting like Gestapo and KGB. If they can get to one man, they're using his family. They're like gangsters. They're, they're no different than the mafia right now, those politicians. Jason Kenny comes in front of the cameras. He's the premier of Alberta. And this is what he says. I will crush Pavlovsky's. That's what he said to the media. I will crush Pavlovsky's. Excuse me. You're going to crush my daughter? You're going to crush my mom? You're going to crush my father? And, and, and why? Why are you going to crush me and my family? Because I opened the church that I give hope in this crazy crisis when people are suicidal, when people are turning into drugs and alcohol. You're going to crush my family because I am a pastor in a free and democratic society? Is this a conduct of a premier of a province in the democratic country? No, he is a mafia boss. He's a Cosa Nostra, and he's using police and the courts as a means to destroy opposition just like the chinese are doing just like the russians are doing he is no different no rule of law he's a mafia casa nostra guy using police as his gangsters to harass intimidate and to harass. all right so we were taken to to the police custody i was thrown uh, head down uh, into the police car uh, van i could not fit my feet were sticking out so i was threatened i would be charged with assault if i if my feet will not fit into the van but i was just the box is very small it's only intended for an in, for a prisoner to sit but they threw me on my back and I was not fitting. I was just like, my feet were out. So it was insane. Finally, I, with my help, we managed to put my feet up and my head down. So that's how I traveled for an hour, laying down 100 kilo on my wrist, uh, handcuffed in extreme pain. I was tortured for one hour. To this day, my wrist is damaged and I have tingling in my fingers. So that's what, 10 days after my arrest, more, 11 days. You know, so they've damaged my wrist intentionally and they took us to the, 
to jail where we were in solitary confinement, uh, not allowed to sleep every half hour. There was bang on the door. Uh, some officer would come and make sure we cannot sleep. The lights were so bright. Uh, you couldn't you couldn't even cover your head. You know, you couldn't sleep. And there was concrete. We were forced to be on the concrete for like 30 hours. Uh, eventually, uh, guards changed and some human came because the Gestapo left and humans showed up. And then finally, he says, this is this is wrong. What, what is happening to you is wrong. And he provided us with the mattress. However, that didn't last that long because an hour or two later we were transferred to prison and when we were stripped uh, naked search our clothes were taken we were thrown into this filthiest jail uh, a tank they call it a tank i call it fish tank where the fresh fish is arriving i'm thinking i'm telling you <clears throat> the cell looked like someone went and peed all over the place it was sticky it was filthy it was dirty and you gotta remember why i'm telling the story because we were arrested for endangering people right inciting people to come to church not obeying the health so orders so uh, it's a very interesting that we were thrown into a place that if there was a serious virus, if there was a leprosy or something black, like we would all be dead. 20, 30 inmates coming in and out into this field. All of us are infected. All of us, it's a cross, uh, you know, transmission and, and it's, it's, it's just sickening. I mean, I'm here because of health and I'm being, you know, I'm, I'm being jeopardized. My health is being jeopardized because you are thrown into this filthy, filthy thing that it looked like no one cleans for years. And you could see write-ups on the wall, 1992. So 30 years, no one paints this stuff. No one cleans it. It's insane. It's insane. So. However, in this ordeal, there were some good people. There were some good jailers, and I promised them that I'm going to mention this. Not all officers are bad. Not all police officers are evil Gestapo. There's some good police officers, and there are some good jailers. And we've met those good jailers. One, a Staff Sergeant Campbell, he, he was so shocked by what is happening uh, that he provided us with the mattress for, for the short time. Another officer, Daniels, I, I asked him, he says, what can I do for you? Because this is wrong, what is happening. I said, if I can get a cup of coffee, please. And he went himself, and he got from his own place a cup of coffee. You know, so you have some humans over there. When we were stripped naked, searched, uh, we had to give up our clothes. There was one jailer that says, Pastor Arthur, remember, Jesus is with you. I mean, those things are precious. While they were mocking us, the other jailers were lifting their hands and said, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, mocking us. Others were seeing what is happening and they were disturbed. There was another shift uh, gentleman, a, a boss, a uh, supervisor from the shift, uh, night shift, and he comes and he's physically shaken. He says, this is horrible. And you know what? He says, I am a Catholic and what, I, what I'm seeing here is just wrong. What they're doing to you is, is evil, is wrong. I'm going to do everything in my power to help you, to help you out and to, to, for you to be treated normally. I mean, we're not asking for extra treatment. We're not asking, hey, treat us better or what? No, just treat us like humans, like any other inmate. But that was denied to us. So for three hours, I watched this Catholic man, this night shift a supervisor that came with his team. Three hours, he fought with the bosses just to give us a place to sleep because we were all this time on concrete and he couldn't get the authorization. They refused. They refused to give us a, a bed. Eventually, three hours later, after uh, watching him fight with his superiors, he says, they say no. They, they just told me no. Uh, so I don't know what to do. I'm going to try to get you a mattress and a blanket because it was extremely cold. Like, I mean, extremely shivering cold. And we are there um, in the name of health, being treated like prisoners in Siberia and jeopardizing our health and the health of other inmates. And finally, three in the morning. So I was arrested with Brother David Saturday. So we spent Saturday night, uh, Sunday night, and finally three in the morning, he provided us with the, with the blanket and no pillow and... Um, and the mattress and six in the morning we were uh, shackled our feet were shackled and we were taken to to court to see the judge three hours waiting to see the lawyers and another interesting part of this is that the lawyers asked to uh, ask for the jailers to tell us that they're waiting for our phone call that um, they need to contact us that was never three days we are in jail was never passed to us that the lawyers are asking to see to talk to us also we asked a number of times to have access to the lawyer that was denied to us they did not allow us to, to call a lawyer in in Riemann until the night shift uh, check, you know, people came and then finally our rights were restored to us. Uh, we were taken to court. We saw the judge. The judge ordered our release, and that didn't happen until seven hours later. After we were again thrown in, uh, so, you know, in this tank uh, where when you sat down and you got stuck to the to the bench because it was so filthy. I'm talking about mold on the ceiling. I'm talking about it looked like no one cleans this place ever. And that's where we were thrown again, watching other inmates coming in and out from that first fish tank where someone looked like someone peed all over the place. So about 20 inmates were going to that other cell that we spent the whole uh, night in and then finally 7 p.m three days they released us from jail and that was a beautiful moment also because when we were released someone from the jail system from the prison presented us with the two red bibles and i just i think it was that catholic uh, supervisor that just wanted to uh, let us know we're not alone that there are some people like us and it, that was a beautiful moment you know getting a bible because the bible was denied to us um, we were not allowed to read the bible until the human jailers came and finally for an hour or two i was given the bible with that coffee from uh, mr with police officer daniels and um, staff surgeon campbell so what i'm trying to say is in every department there are humans 
the good people and they're monsters, the gangsters, they're evil people and Gestapo type of uh, individuals. So don't lose hope because uh, sometimes we have tendency to, to throw all of them and say, that's it, there's no hope. No, there's always hope. There's always hope and we've seen it. We've seen the light in the darkness over there. Amazing, amazing parallels um, to, to also the suffering of our Lord. You, you spent three days uh, and, and then we're finally released, sort of like a resurrection uh, after the three days uh, from, from Good Friday to uh, Easter Sunday. Uh, just amazing stuff. But this is so disturbing that, uh, you know, you are being persecuted not only by the police, but the police are obviously picking up on kind of the threats from politicians. And you've been vilified in the media so that, you know, you're, you're getting the sort of punishment. Now, that also rubs off. There's no, it's not only the jailers who are going to crush the Pavlovskis. No, no, no. It also rubs off in terms of the public. When the politicians, when the media go after someone and vilify them, uh, it is very dangerous because you can create that kind of mob mentality to have people uh, do vigilante action. And that indeed did happen uh, with someone trying to burn down your house with you and your family still in it. Tell us what happened there. You know, the media for months, for months they're doing those, I call them hit, uh, hit, hit pieces on, on us, and they would write stories uh, portraying me as a white supremacist, a super spreader, portraying me as a racist. And, you know, for the record, half of our church goers are colored people. I myself am, am partially colored. My grandma was from Romania. So to say, you know, when you see my father, you think he is Arab because, you know, he has dark skin. So to, to say that we are white supremacists and racists is, is unbelievable. It's just a pure lie. We have people from Asia, from China. We have people... Uh, from Jamaica, Africa, attending our church, we have Native Americans. Half of the people I feed on the streets are Native Americans, so colored people. Uh, reds, blacks, uh, yellow, and I mean, I always say that if Martians were heal, here, I would uh, allow them to come and I would feed them as well. And everyone is welcome at the Lord's table. That's what I say always. Everyone is welcome to participate at the Lord's table. Those tables are not mine. They are His. That's God's tables. He provides the food for the people. I'm not going to say anything. You're welcome to come. You're homosexual and you're hungry, you're welcome to come. You're transgender, you're hungry, you're welcome to come. You're a Muslim, you're hungry, you're welcome to come. It doesn't matter. We don't ask questions. What is your political uh, you know association where you came from um you know what is your faith what do you believe in are you atheist no we set up tables and we welcome everyone that wants to come everyone that needs to come everyone that's hungry is welcome to come they don't have to listen to our preaching they can grab food and move on with their lives but many people do want to listen and they participate in our church services so the same with the uh, church that i run in the building everyone is welcome to come we have uh, actually a lady that identifies herself as a homosexual and uh, actually she was defending us on the news she says like this is unbelievable what you're doing this is a lie this is just not what it is. So what they're doing for months, they're vilifying us, vilifying me, uh, telling people untrue uh, things that I hate people, that I hate colored people, that I, I am just this evil monster that needs to be stopped. And the politicians did the same thing. Uh, Jason Kenney, the premier of Alberta, that's not the first time he goes in front of cameras vilifying me, calling me white supremacist and racist. This is not the first time. Now he says, I'll crush Pavlovsky's. So that sends a message to really evil people to hurt us. And that's exactly what happened. I blame the media and the politicians to what happened to us. Someone set our garage on fire and if it was not for the neighbor caught you know the caught this very early we would die in fire a chief firefighter came and he said to me you know we were extremely blessed not to die today because just just few weeks before the garage caught fire and the whole house went in flames you know so this is not a joke we're not talking about ah someone doesn't like me no this is it's the next step they want my children dead they want my wife to die they want me to be murdered i mean this is sickening if you really think about it and excuse me for what what have i done my people are healthy I'm healthy. We are happy people. We have peace in this crisis. We come together. We are family. People come out of their free will. They're healthy people. Uh, you know, if, if you don't feel uh, good, you stay at home. You can go and quarantine yourself. That's okay. But this is the first time in the history of mankind when the healthy people are commanded to quarantine. You always, historically speaking, always has been the other way around. If you're sick, you stay away from the healthy population. But this is a reverse situation right now. It's, it's absolutely sickening what they're doing. And they're doing this on purpose. They're doing this to destroy our lives. So, um, I feed the homeless people, like I said, and, and and for that deed, I'm not charging a penny from the government. Everything we do is uh, is run by volunteers. I do not receive a salary. I have not received a salary for seven years. And now I'm being targeted by the politicians, by the mainstream media, and now I'm suffering tens of thousands of dollars loss because why, excuse me, because I opened the church. Don't come. You don't want to come, don't come. You don't want to be fed, don't come. Go to McDonald's, go to restaurants. I, you know, that's your choice. But there's a lots of people, thousands of them actually, that are relying on our services. And for that I'm being targeted, for that you want me murdered? Unbelievable. All right. So, Arthur, if you could, Pastor Arthur, if you could give us uh, your uh, really thoughts on what Canadians should do right now. We're all in this boat. Most of us are prevented from going to church, going to mass, uh, even going in sometimes. Uh, but and, and then they're trying to suggest that we do it all virtually. Um, what's your message of uh, encouragement for Canadians? You know, when um, when I became a Christian, 
I remember the times where I was a very comfortable Christian. I was a businessman and, and pretty much what I wanted from God is, and that's the truth, is just God bless my business, bless my company, okay? Just make me a very, very, you know, wealthy person. And, and then I will give you a little bit out of that wealth. So I was a lukewarm, really uninterested in his kingdom, selfish, self-centered, me, I, and myself. And I think most of the Christians, unfortunately, are right like that, like I was before most of the clergymen. It's all about them. They're hired guns. They're not real shepherds of God's people. Because Jesus says when a real shepherd is attacked or his flock is attacked, he stands up and fight. He fends off the wolves. What we have right now is hired guns. The wolves showed up and they jumped through the windows and left the flock, left the sheep to be devoured uh, by the wolves. So what I did chasing those Nazis, those hyenas away, I just defended the people inside. You don't have a right to intimidate and harass people while they're on their knees and praying and crying and talking to God and worshiping him. It is just pure evil. Even the communists didn't do it. Uh, so get out. And if every pastor, if every clergyman would do stuff like this, this whole fight would be over. We would win within a day. That's how powerful we are. So my message to you is this. Lions never bow before hyenas. We do not cooperate with hyenas. We do not work with the Gestapo. We oppose evil. It's always the right thing to do the right thing. We have to push evil. The light has to keep shining. If the salt loses its saltiness, it will be useless, good for nothing. It will be trampled by men. Right now, the church is being trampled by men. We have been called unessential services. Uh, we are being called, we don't want you, we don't need you. Shut your doors and disappear. While Walmart is being celebrated as the new God of the land. So we have a choice. We can be like Joshua and say, as for me and my household, we shall serve the Lord. Or we can say, okay, we're going to serve idols of the land. The government is more powerful than God, so therefore we're going to bow before that golden image. Let me remind you about Shadrach, Michigan, and Abednego. They were told by the law, you have to bow. And they said, no, they end up in the fiery furnace. And Jesus shows up. Let me remind you about Daniel. Law said you cannot pray. Just like the law says we cannot gather, we cannot do stuff today. What did Daniel do? He opens the windows and he prays. Let's go to Mordecai and Haman. The law said you have to bow before Haman. Mordecai chooses not to. He breaks the law for the glory of God because you should not bow before elected officials. You are only to worship and bow before the living God. Esther goes before the king against the law. The book of Acts chapter 4 and 5 apostles are saying to the authorities, we must obey God rather than men. The Bible is filled with rebellious people, but rebellious not towards God, because the rebellion is like a spirit of divination, it's like a witchcraft when you rebel against God. But you must, you must rebel against evil. You have to. You have to oppose the darkness. You have to stand against the devil and his minions, because if you don't, the Bible in Revelation says the cowardly, the fearful, will not, will not inherit the kingdom of God. So you're risking your salvation when you say to God, I don't trust you enough. I don't believe that you can take me out of the speckle. I have more faith in the government than in you, God. You're not powerful enough. Your hand is too short. You, I don't have faith. I don't think you can rescue me. I am more afraid of men than I am afraid of God. This is the tragedy that we're witnessing right now. So my message is very clear. Rise up. Stand up. Be courageous. Push the darkness away. Bring your light. Be sold. That penetrates every aspect. Political, mainstream media, educational system, health system, uh, you know, justice system. We all should penetrate all of those uh, departments for the glory of God. Who is this devil? Don't you understand that God holds our enemies in the palm of his hands? They are only alive because he allows them to be alive. Don't we understand that greater is he that is in us than the one that is in them? Don't we know that the story ends victoriously? We know how the story ends. We know that Jesus wins. And when you stand with Jesus, you win also. You have to stand. You have to obey. You have to have faith. The Bible says that without faith, you cannot please God. Jesus says, when I come back, will I find faith on earth? It looks like the church lost faith. It looks like the church rather obeys the government than their God that they say they are serving. And where are the leaders? We are a leaderless generation. We have no leaders in the political arena now because they, are, they, they should be charged with treason. They're traitors to the people. They work against the people. Also, we have no leaders in the churches because they ran away. They jumped from the ship, a ship and they uh, left us to die, to be devoured by hyenas and wolves. So lions rise up. Stand up. The Bible says one can do a thousand, but two can do ten thousand. So my call is this. Rise up, people. Church, rise up. This is our time to shine. The people are desperate. The people are suicidal. People are dying. They're turning into drugs and alcohol. Now it's our time to shine. Jesus said, this is the time for the last harvest. He wants his last harvest. Jesus is coming back. He is coming back to judge the living and the dead. Rise up. Bring him those souls that he died on that cross for. Wow. Pastor Pawlowski, thank you for your defense of Canada, of freedom to worship. One last uh, question for you, uh, especially for our listeners. Your journey, uh, you, you mentioned you were uh, going to be a, a priest, you were in a monastery, and then you ended up in, in uh, away and, and uh, then away from the church uh, and then didn't uh, stay with the Catholic Church at all. How did you get there and, uh, and what's your take right now on the Catholic Church? Well, here's my, you know, I love history, right? I was to become a priest. I, unfortunately, I saw a huge corruption. Uh, in uh, organized religion, a huge corruption. And I had to ha make a choice. My older friends that were already um, taken, they, you know, parties, girls, and, and just worldliness. And I said, if I am to live a lifestyle like this, I can't. I would be a hypocrite for the rest of my life. So I went to the other side of the fence. I started to do business. I became a smuggler, a businessman. And I met my wife. My, my wife was a Christian. And she was always telling me about this Jesus. She was telling me about this God of the Bible. And I didn't want to have anything to do with this. But you know, the power of women, slowly, slowly, she asked me to take to take her to church. So I started to listen. I started to read the Bible. People read the Bible. God hates evil. He hates corruption. He hates 
organized religion that is not serving Jesus. And that is Catholic, Protestant, Baptist, it doesn't matter. When in every organized religion, they are corrupted people, but God is not corrupted God. He is a holy God. He's a pure God. So I, my take is this, read the Bible, worship God, serve him and serve him only. Do not allow corruption into your heart. Have a pure heart and a clean hands before God and worship him wherever you can. If you want to come to the Catholic church and go over there and worship God with truth and in spirit, do that. If you want to go to a Protestant church and worship God with truth and in spirit, worship. You know, sometimes we are bound by tradition and where we grew up, and I work with the Catholic Church. We that, uh, we've done um, marches for Jesus together in Poland and other, other places. You know, my take on all of this is, is very simple. Read the Bible, worship your God, worship your God, bow to him only. Yes. Well, I would uh, pray for you because I think uh, the Lord has in store for you another chapter in your life. You are so faithful to defending our Lord, to showing what true Christians should do with regard to freedom of worship and maintaining that despite anything the world would throw at you. When you left the Catholic Church, you also left the John chapter 6, uh, you know, body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord and Holy Communion. And you might not be there yet or think about that much, but I would encourage you, uh, because I would be remiss in, in not doing so for a brother whom I so admire. Uh, what you're doing is incredible for the faith, for Canada. I would hope one day you would reconsider on, with regard to, particularly, look at John 6, where our Lord promises himself in Holy Communion. Uh, it's repeated over and over again in the scriptures. And I hope you take that to heart, not as a, as a means to browbeat you, but just in love as a brother in Christ. Um, you're doing amazing work. And if a horrible sinner, a coward like me, uh, gets to receive our Lord, um, you should too. My goodness, it's been a great honor for me to speak with you, Pastor Pawlowski. God bless you and thank you. Thank you very much. God bless you. Hey everyone, if you want to support Pastor Arthur Pawlowski in his quest for freedom of faith, freedom of worship in Canada, please do so at lifefunder.com. We've set it up there for him, lifefunder.com, so that you can support Pastor Arthur in his work to keep freedom of worship alive in Canada. One of the most courageous pastors, as you can see, in Canada. Please pray for him and donate at lifefunder.com. Thank you. Hi, this is John Henry Weston, the co-founder and editor-in-chief of LifeSite News. I'm coming to you today because we want to be sure that we are communicating clearly with you, our loyal followers. Things are really heating up, as I'm sure you can see. Christians, conservative truth-tellers are being targeted, are being banned from social media platforms like Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram at an alarmingly fast rate. They are attempting to suppress any narrative that does not fit that of the mainstream media. We knew this day would come. We have been warning everyone who would listen and attempting to build up alternative platforms to continue to reach you. We have established ourselves on all sorts of platforms, I'm going to explain in a minute, but the most important thing to do is come direct to LifeSiteNews.com, because there we will always be. But we've also established ourselves on platforms like Parler and MeWe, and our videos can be found on Rumble as well. We would love to see each of you on those platforms too, as they are not censoring or suppressing the truth that we are sharing every single day. More than these alternative social media platforms, we highly encourage you to subscribe to our email newsletter. We have really built up a large list of loyal readers on our email marketing platform, and we have prepared several backup plans for, well... I want to say if, but it's really when, we are removed from our current platform as well. Additionally, I really encourage you, as I said before, to make it a regular habit to go directly to lifesitenews.com. Make it your homepage. While all of these different platforms are an excellent way to curate your news, going directly to our website means that you will never encounter any censorship or sudden loss of LifeSite News reporting. Here's the thing. We will never stop sharing the truth. We founded this organization with the mission to be the life, family, and culture source for men and women who seek to know the truth. We have established a track record of honest reports, and this will never stop, even with censorship happening around the globe. Again, I'm encouraging you to join us on Parler, MeWe, Rumble, and on our email list. You can find all the direct links in the description of this video. May God bless you and keep you, and we are so thankful that you've chosen to follow and support LifeSite News. I'm John Henry Weston, co-founder and editor-in-chief of LifeSite News.